So first, uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's really a great pleasure to come to the beautiful Kingston and the Queen's University. I uh, had a very nice conversation with people this morning, and uh, yeah, I learned many interesting things. So I hope uh, like vice versa for this uh, colloquium. Uh, yeah, and by the way, it's my first uh, trip in two years, so it's really nice to be like, <laughs> to be in person. Yeah. And uh, so in, in this talk, I will discuss some, um, something about our universe, and uh, especially the, the dark side of the universe. So I'm interested in uh, understanding uh, two things, uh, the dark matter and the neutrinos, and the potential uh, theoretical connections between the two, and how can we find out these connections experimentally if they exist. So that'd be the, I the idea of the, the, this talk. And uh, so let me uh, move on. And first, I want to like mention these are not news anymore. I think it's already happened for many years, and you have heard the talks uh, about them. So there are two milestones, or m maybe most importantly, the mo pillars for the modern physics. Uh, one is the standard model, and the other is the uh, general relativity. And uh, in 2012, we find the Higgs boson, which is the last uh, last missing particle from the table of standard model particles. And uh, so we complete uh, the like uh, this theory, uh, successfully find all the particles there, and so the standard model works. And on the other hand, we also find uh, the gravitational waves. That's another uh, like a uh, strong evidence supporting that the Einstein theory is uh, is working. So these are two very important uh, uh, like pillars of modern physics, and with these theories, we can try to explore uh, our beautiful universe. Uh, and uh, and actually, this is, this is not something that we, we just uh, like, uh, occurred to us to, us to do uh, after those discoveries. Like I'm just showing a paper like a back in, you can look at the year there, uh, which is highlighted. That's uh, like a more than half a century ago, people already, some people after learning some cosmology and already just know uh, protons and neutrons exist and they make up the nucleus, the, the periodic table, they want to understand how the primordial elements can be uh, produced in the early universe and why like, they exist in our universe. So this is like a, one of the first tries uh, in the early days. And after that, like, uh, we have learned many things with the help of uh, experimental observations. And now today, we are having a relatively uh, complete, uh, or maybe a big picture of what happens to our universe in the, uh, back in time. So we have this big bound picture of the universe where we have like a different uh, epochs. The universe is ex expanding, and at uh, back when you dial the clock back, you have a period where the, the primordial elements were formed, and where the cosmic uh, uh, recombination occurs. The universe becomes transparent, so you get the uh, cosmic macro big background as the like a remnant of the uh, big bang, and then later the galaxies and stars form, and then like uh, evolves our built universe. And uh, so what I'm writing here is the particle cosmology, and, uh, which means that, that uh, it, this is like uh, the relatively early stage of our universe when it's young, so that the universe is kind of smallish, and uh, so things are dense, so we have particle physics, important particle physics processes going on that uh, sets the initial conditions for the later stages. And so this is uh, about cosmology. And uh, so I'm just uh, showing this slide, so in order to like, uh, have the theory to agree with the experiment. So we have all kinds of experimental handles. And now we like, uh, can make up our universe with a recipe. So that is this table and uh, some proper initial conditions of the primordial perturbations. And here is what uh, our universe looks like today. And so this is the energy budget of the total universe. So we have uh, like, uh, the atoms. So these are made of, we are made of. It's only a prizing, comprising 5% uh, of the universe. And then the rest is pretty, like, uh, is littered with unknown stuff. So there is the dark matter where I put the question mark here. So that will be the topic of this talk. Uh, I'll talk uh, a lot more about it. And then there's the dark energy, which is driving the fast, exp the ex accelerating expansion of our universe. Uh, so I will not talk about it, but I, I can just uh, attribute it to a cosmological constant. And uh, so there are, this is a deep subject I'm not going to uh, go any further, but I'll focus on the, on the one quarter of the universe. I try to be modest. And uh, so dark matter. So those, uh, we know this dark matter from these observations, like the CMB, the distribution of photons, and the distribution of galaxies, and the 
yeah, so we can like uh, derive the the uh, number, the fraction of dark matter in the universe. But that's not the only evidence. We also see it in other uh, places. There is really a very rich and compelling evidence for the dark matter to exist in our universe. At, these are the, like uh, probably observations at relatively smaller scales. So people look at the clusters of galaxies, this is the coma cluster, and look at the just individual galaxies, the rotational curves of the stars, and look at the collision of two uh, cluster of galaxies. And then in mo all the cases, we are finding something that uh, the, the general relativity, or maybe just Newton's law doesn't work, f not equal to ma. So what can you do with this, right? You are seeing something that's gravitating, but you can't see with light. So there are two possibilities. One is that M is wrong. Uh, what you see is not uh, what is shining. Uh, and the other is that A is wrong, so the gravity is wrong. I will not like, resort to the second possibility, because I think uh, general relativity have passed many important tests. And what I will like, attribute to is the, the missing mass. So that is the dark matter in the universe. So there is something that gravitating and uh, causing the, like, the gravitational effect. Am I okay? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but, but we cannot see it with uh, the normal light. So we need to rely on other uh, evidences. So let's, here's a summary table. I try to make it long enough. So what we have learned about the dark matter in the universe. So we know a few things. So let me try to like, uh, read the list. So first, we know there is a mass range of dark matter. And uh, it's a really big range, by the way. It's like a, uh, from 10 to the minus 20 electron volt to 10 to the 4 solar masses. That's like 80 orders of magnitude. So this is like really not uh, telling you any useful information. This is a range. that You can't violate that range, but it's not hard to satisfy the range either. Uh, and the second is that the dark matter has to be there to, to be alive, to be there to, to drive the gravitational effect. So it cannot decay away, disappear, because then uh, not have dark matter. So it has to be relatively stable uh, or cosmologically long-lived. And also the dark matter has to be cold in order to, for the structure to form uh, successfully. Uh, so I will address uh, what that means uh, more later. And the dark matter has to be less collisional than the atoms because we see the bullet cluster events that pass through each other, but dark matter do not uh, slow down as much as the baryons. And, uh, Another thing we know is dark matter is not a known particle. So I will review the, uh, why it is not is the case. And uh, another thing we know, I t just talk about, is the relic abundance of dark matter comprised about a quarter of the total energy budget. I try to make the list long, so, but uh, in the end, I, I decided I just add another one. Our knowledge is really limited. So it's really uh, like uh, many possibilities. Uh, and we try to know the answer. So the first thing I want to do is that like, I think every, every student who works on, every person who works on dark matter must have done this exercise at the, at the beginning, is how like, a standard model fails to accommodate dark matter. So we know all these uh, particles, we found them in the laboratories. So can, the first question I could ask is, can any of these particles be the dark, play the role of the dark matter? Do they qualify to be the dark matter in the universe? Right? So this is, this is the uh, question. And what I will do is that I will use the, the list of things I know about dark matter and to see if any of them, them can be uh, possible. And so uh, I, can, I can use my criteria. So the first one is the dark matter should not be very collisional. And uh, in terms of their, for the mass scale we are talking about here, so that means they should not be uh, electric uh, charged or they should not participate in the strong interaction. And you can see this is a very powerful standard and it kills most of the particles in the table. So th uh, by the way, I think this is a colloquium I should <laughs> explain. The standard model is made of uh, fermions and uh, bosons. So there are quarks and uh, uh, lepto charged leptons and the neutrinos. And then there are force carriers, the gluon, photon, and the gauge boson. And then there's the Higgs boson. So this is a standard model particle content. And then some of these particles are charged or colored, which means they participate in uh, strong or electromagnetic interaction. And all the particles that cross out here are like a in that category, so they can't be the dark matter. Otherwise, we won't have the universe as we see. And the second, as I said, the dark matter has to be long-lived enough. And the, so the, the one which I'm cross out, the Z boson and the Higgs boson, they decay very quickly. We produce them at the colliders, and they just live for a short period and decay away. So that's not long enough to 
um, be the dark matter. And then another thing is the dark matter should have a mass, right? So matter is non-relativistic. Non you can't, uh, like, uh, you can't have no mass, and uh, so that uh, kills the photon. Uh, so, so here is uh, something uh, I should want to uh, say a little bit more. So in the standard model, within the context of standard model, the theory, uh, it also predicts uh, the neutrinos are massless. But actually, we know they are not from the, uh, from the experiment. And uh, so, so I don't, keep, I don't get remove the neutrino uh, because of this standard. But neutrinos eventually are ruled out to be the dark matter candidate, not because of, uh, they don't have a mass, but because they are too light. And uh, so let me uh, explain a little bit why this is the case. Uh, so first, let me uh, tell you uh, what's neutrinos. Uh, probably, I'm like, this is Queen's University, so I should like, be brief in this page. So neutrinos is part of the uh, standard model uh, particle content, right? You just saw it in the table. And uh, in the standard model, uh, like, uh, they only participate in the weak interaction, mediated by the W and the Z bosons. And there are three types of neutrinos. So the, like they, we call them flavors. So there's electron, muon, and the tau flavors of neutrinos. And the neutrino the idea was first introduced by Pauli back in the early last century because he wants to balance the energy and the momentum conservation in the neutron beta decays. So neutron decays to a, uh, we see neutron decays into a proton and uh, an electron, but then energy conservation is wrong, and the neutrino Will, that was introduced to address that uh, issue. And here, uh, like, uh, neutrinos is produced from the neutron decay, and these are final state. And uh, it's important for it to be there for the kinematics to, to work. OK, so this is neutrinos. And uh, another thing I, should, uh, I must show here is that uh, so another milestone uh, of beyond the standard model physics about neutrinos is that we see neutrinos can oscillate each other. So we produce neutrinos experimentally, and we see that they, they don't stay in their original flavor. They change from one type to another. And this could only happen if neutrino has a mass. And uh, therefore, uh, neutrino mass is serving as another important evidence for beyond the standard model physics. Uh, so now come to the question, why neutrino doesn't work to be the dark matter? And there is this uh, very important uh, constraint. Uh, first, the neutrino is a fermion. Okay, so it's, a, it's not a boson, it's a fermion. And uh, we can look at our universe and, for example, look at the galaxies or even the smaller called the dwarf galaxies uh, that's orbiting around the big galaxy. And we know the dwarf galaxies, they don't shine too much, but they have mass, so they are mostly made of the dark matter if uh, like, uh, the dark matter is introduced. Then uh, if the neutrino is a fermion and you put them in, a lot of them in uh, a region, a dwarf galaxy, they pack up the Fermi C, right? That's what we learn from uh, thermal physics. So you, you pack up the Fermi C, and which means that uh, the more neutrino you put there, th like the, the more fermion you put there, the more relativistic some of them you get, get right, become. But because you pack up the Fermi C, the Fermi momentum is higher and higher. And eventually, if the, the fermion is too light, you get uh, so many of them that the, the highest uh, momentum, or highest energy one, or highest uh, velocity one will just escape the, the dwarf galaxy. It's not gravitationally bound. So that's a, that's a constraint because we do see the dwarf galaxies with certain masses. So you have to accommodate that with the dark matter. And this sets a lower bound roughly of the order of KeV scale. A KeV is about 1,000 of uh, electron uh, volt. And so this is a constraint from uh, cosmology. And I want to mention that this is only working this bound only applies if you assume this fermionic dark matter spin half is comprising all the dark matter. If it's just comprising a small fraction, then you may not resort to this bound. But I, since I'm, I know nothing about dark matter, I want to be minimal. So I'm assuming that this some fermion is all the dark matter, here, for example, neutrinos. And I'm asking this question, and then uh, like, uh, I get this bound. On the other hand, from particle physics, we have an like independent constraint from the beta decays, and actually not from the beta decay of the neutron, but uh, from the beta decay of the tritium. And we know that uh, the neutrinos cannot have a uh, too big mass because that will ruin the kinematics, and that's an uh, upper bound, 1.1 electron volt from the Katrin ex experiment. And these two bounds are not consistent with each other, which means the neutrinos cannot be all the dark matter in the universe. Okay, so all the particles in the standard model fails. Um, and uh, so the assumption of this talk 
Um, it doesn't, it's not necessarily true, but I'm going to assume it here, is that uh, the dark matter is a new particle. It's a, it's a fun, like, a, it's, I'm assuming it's a particle, so there's a Lagrangian. If a theorist, you like to start with a Lagrangian to work on this problem, and uh, I'm assuming it's a particle, and it's de described by a Lag Lagrangian from, I can use quantum field theory to, to describe the dark matter. And this is a very familiar concept that in modern physics, we find many particles. We, all, we know that they are all described by uh, some sort of Lagrangian. So uh, modern, modern particle physics are like, uh, uh, always involves finding new particles. So it's not surprising, or it's pretty natural to think that dark matter is also a new particle. And I said it's not necessarily true, because we know there are other possibilities, like the black holes. The massive black holes can be the dark matter, and they are not particles. They are not described by a Lagrangian. Uh, but I will not assume that. I assume it's a particle. Uh, but still, there are too many possibilities. And uh, next, I'm going to ask a question. Like, uh, if you have you hand me a theory of dark matter, there's actually one thing you should uh, probably address: is that uh, can the theory explain the origin of the dark matter in the universe? Right? We see that it's a quarter of the total energy of the universe today. So, can your theory address that? Okay. And uh, I also want to point out this is not mandatory. So like, uh, you are free, like, we don't know dark matter uh, what it is. So you are free to think of like, whatever theories that uh, like, uh, help you to find it experimentally. And, uh, so, but I'm thinking that since we are finding some black cat in a dark room, so probably you, if you have a clue, which is uh, like the relic abundance, you probably want to use it. right? So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going, assuming dark matter is a particle. And I'm thinking, uh, I'm talking about uh, some theories that explains dark matter, not only just the nature, but also the origin of dark matter. And uh, so that's, that's the second assumption. And uh, a benefit of this is that when you talk about specific theories for the, uh, addressing the origin, it usually comes the dark matter has some additional interaction with known particles other than gravity. And this is, can be helpful for finding the dark matter, especially find it again, not using the gravitational effect, but using this new interaction that uh, uh, help for the relic boundaries. So this will be uh, where we are heading to. And uh, still, there are a lot of uh, like, uh, possibilities. And I'm going to further narrowing down to the neutrino and the dark matter connection. And before talking about uh, specific theories, let me first mention this, uh, some, um, like, uh, what I'm seeing here. Uh, like uh, simple motivations. Uh, so the neutrino and dark matter, in many senses, they are very similar to each other. Uh, so they are both the remnant of the Big Bang uh, theory. Uh, so they, they exist in the universe today. And uh, we just uh, see this uh, test. The neutrinos were close to dark matter, but uh, almost passed the test, but uh, still fails because the mass is not large enough. And there are other similarities. For example, like we know neutrinos and dark matter are both very abundant around us. Our galaxy has a halo of dark matter around it. So we have dark matter. If, if the dark matter has a mass like a proton, it's passing through my hand, like uh, billions of them are doing that uh, at this moment. And the similar are for the neutrinos. They are made in the sun. They are made in the atmosphere. They are made everywhere. And uh, also, another similarity is they are, both of them are pretty hard to uh, detect. So what we have to do is that we have to build a very big and clean detectors. And we go deep underground, like the snow lab, and we, we put detectors there and wait for the signals to occur. And this way, we found, uh, successfully found the neutrinos from the sun and from the atmosphere. And uh, we haven't found the dark matter yet. Uh, but neutrinos are sometimes considered as the important background for the dark matter detection. So these are their uh, similarities. And then, so now let me talk about uh, what uh, you can do with uh, if you take this connection seriously. Right? Actually, this is a very useful starting point and it can lead to many uh, useful uh, theories that's being studied now. Uh, so the first one is uh, the WIMP dark matter. So this is assuming the dark matter is like a, a heavy copy of neutrino. And the neutrinos have weak interaction, right? I said. And the dark matter is also having a weak interaction. So that is called the weakly interacting massive particle scenario, the WIMP. And I think many of the uh, people here are doing uh, experiment at the Snow Lab to, to uh, look for the WIMP dark matter particle. But that's not the only possibility. So there is also, uh, like, uh, nowadays, the dark sector is probably a more like a buzzword. So the dark sector, what it means is that uh, you may 
think our world is pretty rich, right? We have all the standard model particles to make up the, our, sec our theory. And the dark matter might also live in such a sector. So it's not just an individual particle, but it belongs to a more uh, bigger structure, it's uh, uh, its own theory. And uh, this theory, if it's called a neutrino portal, it's interacting with known particles through the neutrinos. Uh, so this is called a neutrino uh, portal dark sector. Uh, so this has uh, some uh, like a new interest recently. And uh, what I'm going to talk about here uh, a lot in this talk will be called uh, the strong neutrino uh, dark matter. So in this case, I will explain the more details, but in a nutshell, so here in this scenario, the neutrinos and dark matter are part of each other. I'll, I'll explain what it means, but this will be our talk. And uh, we can also I can think of other possibilities. For example, I, ex I mentioned earlier that the neutrinos have mass and the standard model cannot explain. So you can ask the question, can the dark matter, which is also mysterious, can it uh, be used to address the origin of neutrino mass, right? So this is uh, also a natural uh, possibility. So yeah, I'm going to end my list here, and I will focus on, on the strong neutrino. And here is a fun plot I steal from a recent uh, talk. Uh, so this is a plot showing the mass range of the dark matter. And uh, so there are like, different candidates, like uh, the WIMP and the strong neutrino, and the primordial black holes. And basically, the width of the rectangle is the possible mass range of the dark matter. And the height of the triangle is how many papers have been written in each of the subjects. So you can see this, this, is, this is far from being the complete uh, list of dark matter. Right? There are a lot of them. Uh, but you can see that uh, there are some of the candidates are really taken very seriously. And there is the strong neutrino dark matter that's, uh, that's here. And uh, by the way, you can see they are all proposed very early, like, uh, in, like more than 30 years ago. And so what is the strong neutrino dark matter? So yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this table of standard model particles I just show. And I'm going to introduce a new particle that's a fermion, has a spin half. and. Uh, that uh, has the following uh, properties. I'm going to just add it to the table. And what happens is that this uh, strong neutrino, I call it the new S, it it's, uh, has a mixing with the active neutrinos, so new E, new mu, new tau. So I'm calling it a new A, which can be just a linear combination of the three. And uh, then uh, I'm going to use the language of quantum mechanics because there's playing a useful role here. So there is the, I'm, having the mass eigenstate on the le left hand side and the it's called the flavor eigenstate on the right hand side so the left hand side are physical and the the, the right hand side are flavor eigenstate which means they either participate in the weak interaction like a new a or does not participate in weak interaction at all which is new s but they are not physical state because they are not mass eigenstate these are physical and our dark matter candidate will be uh, this one i call it a new 4 so it's the heaviest one uh, and the so it has uh, some component of active and uh, strong neutrinos. So that's the convention. And uh, so the first thing, uh, first consequence of this, uh, by the way, this is a really simple dark matter candidate. So I just introduced a fermion. Uh, it, had, it could have a mass. And another parameter would be the mixing angle theta, right? Just two parameters. And uh, I don't even have a symmetry or any reason for the dark matter to be absolutely stable. And actually, it does decay in the theory because of the mixing between the, uh, the active neutrino uh, mixture. So through the quantum fluctuations, so you can imagine there's a dark matter particle here. And at, through quantum fluctuations, at a, at a very short distance, it can fluctuate into a W boson and uh, an electron. And then they find each other back to become a neutrino, but then they can read it a photon here. And the particles in blue letter, they are real particles. So you can see that the dark matter can decay into a photon uh, plus a light neutrino. And this will be uh, one of the signals to look for for the dark matter. And, uh, and this can potentially make the dark matter too short-lived. And we have to uh, uh, like, uh, address the longevity of dark matter using the s either both the small mass and the small mixing theta. And we'll quantify that. Uh, and one thing I would just mention briefly is that a thermal history of uh, uh, like a dark matter uh, is not allowed here. Uh, what a thermal history means is that uh, uh, imagine when the universe, you dial the clock back in the early universe, then the universe was kind of small, so everything was uh, like uh, in contact with each other through the known uh, interactions, the known particles. So that's called the thermal equilibrium with each other. So there's a temperature uh, universal to everybody. 
And we can't do that to the dark matters here, although we add it to the table. And that's because if you like, just do the calculation, you find that uh, like, if you assume the dark matter is produced as abundant as neutrinos, then you will overproduce the relic abundance. So this omega-4 is the one that has to be a quarter. And uh, if the dark matter is a KEV scale, we know it has to be heavier because of the uh, dwarf galaxy constraint, then we, we, we overproduce the dark matter. So that is not an option for the uh, strong neutrino. And uh, we need the theta to be much smaller than 1. Uh, then I uh, come to the question, how do we explain the origin of dark matter? Actually, the mechanism and the candidate was both proposed in this work. Uh, uh, and one of the authors is here uh, sitting in, in the audience. Uh, it's called the Dawson withdrawal mechanism. And how it works, I'm going to explain is that in the early universe, there is some like a non-trivial physics process happening. And uh, so there are two ingredients. One is the weak interaction that's uh, characterized by the G Fermi, the Fermi constant. And then the other is this uh, small mixing angle theta. And what really happens is called the neutrino oscillation in the, in the early universe. And uh, so there is a very nice quantum mechanics I'm going to uh, explain here. Uh, so, so imagine in the early universe when the temperature is high, so neutrinos is in thermal equilibrium. So a particle in thermal equilibrium means that it's constantly being produced and constantly being destroyed. So that's the that's, that's thermal equilibrium means. And there are two time scales that's going to involve here. So why is the time scale for the neutrinos to live between being born and being uh, destroyed? Uh, so that's basically the interaction, uh, uh, interaction uh, rate. And then the second one is uh, the oscillation rate right, the neutrino. is the active neutrino uh, to strong neutrino. The oscillation could occur. And there is a time scale for that uh, process. And the more uh, like uh, precisely, we all know quantum mechanics. So I, I, I think I, I'm, it's appropriate to show a formula here. So we have a Hamiltonian in, in quantum mechanics. And uh, so there are two uh, states, right? I'm talking about a two-level system. Uh, and uh, this is Hamiltonian is written in the basis of the uh, flavor basis, active and uh, strong. And so this is the first term is the, like, basically the, uh, the contribution when you have it in the vacuum. And then the second term is that the, like, the high temperature contribution when the like, universe was hot. You have that piece. And uh, so you put this thing together. What you have to do for the two-level system, you diagonalize the the Hamiltonian, and then you get the two mass eigen states, right? And then you can ask how they evolve with time. And basically, the idea is that when you create an active neutrino at some time, uh, so it's going to be a combination of the new one and new four, right? So this is the flavor, and this is the physical state. And then uh, after some time, the t is non-zero. Each of the state will develop a phase, right? Which is the Hamiltonian. I set h bar to one, by the way, here, uh, in order to just for simplicity. And because the two energies are not equal to each other, uh, this state, after some time t, is no longer equal to the initial state you, you create uh, by the weak interaction. And therefore, when, you, when another weak interaction happens to destroy the active neutrinos, which is the new A at zero, it's not destroying all of this state. So there is a small fraction of the states that's not uh, destroyed because it does not participate in the weak interaction. And that's part of the contribution to the dark matter. Uh, so this is uh, how neutrino oscillation helped to create a dark matter. Uh, and th actually, the, the real story is even more fun, because the weak interaction is happening very frequently in the universe. And uh, the cycle I just talked about, uh, the creation, oscillation, and uh, then destroy, uh, that's one cycle, can happen many times. So basically, we are having uh, like a, oh, this is another formula, just for the probability for the oscillation. I don't think I need to go to the details. And then uh, this is the, basically the rate for the dark matter to be produced. So we have three factors on the right-hand side. Uh, so the first factor is how, of how many times the uh, weak interaction occurs. So that's how many like a new zero you produce at a t equal to zero. Um, so this is the number of cycles. And then the probability is basically for each cycle, there is an oscillation probability for the uh, dark matter for the active to strong neutrino oscillation to occur. And that produces some dark matter uh, in each cycle. And then the last factor is just a Fermi-Dirac, Euro-Fermi-Dirac phase space distribution. So this is a rate equation for the phase space distribution of dark matter. And then we know what to do. We just uh, integrate it over the phase space. We get the number density of the dark matter in the universe. right? Uh, so you can do the calculation. And this is, the, this is like a, the differential. Uh, relic abundance with respect to time. So 
I'm using the temperature as a horizontal axis, but uh, as we know, the universe is expanding, so the time is uh, moving from left to right. And this curve on, shown on this plot, this black curve, basically tells you the height of the curve corresponds to how fast the dark matter relic abundance is built up. Right? This is a differential uh, rate. Uh, and then the area below the curve will be the relic abundance. You have to do the integral. And this is a nice theory. Right? There are two, only two parameters, as I mentioned. This is theta and the mass of the dark matter. So you do the calculation, you can find a curve in the parameter space where the dark matter relic abundance is successfully explained. The quarter, yeah. And the, the parameter we don't know is, we don't know the dark matter mass yet. I should call this M4, apologies to that. And uh, so we, for different dark matter mass, we need a different uh, mixing angle for the relic abundance to be addressed. So this is a really a nice theory, right? It's, uh, it's just quantum mechanics when, when, when you, you, like even a student these days can, can like, uh, understand what's going on here. And it's really uh, like a neat. Uh, so this is a theory. And now what I'm going to show is the, the fact uh, that the theory is not in great shape. Yeah, so you can see there are two set of constraints. So one is the dwarf galaxy constraint I, I just mentioned where you, like, you get a, like a Pauli exclusion that sets lower limit on the dark matter mass. And then there is another set of constraint that rules out the blue region. So that's uh, called the X-ray constraint. So basically, see, considering the dark matter decaying into photons, and the photon is an X-ray. So we have telescopes that look at a different area of the universe, and they can look for the uh, photons. And that rules out the region. And you can see this line is not in great shape. So there is some like uh, parameters that region that's still allowed, maybe. Yeah, and uh, this is the current. And in the future, uh, in about 10 years, we are having another generation of X-ray a telescope called the Athena, and that's going to cover this region. And if I mean, it still may still find something there, but if it doesn't, that means the theory is not a uh, great shape, right? So we, uh, so that's that's the status. And uh, but I want to like uh, point out that this is not. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of a negative uh, result for the original theory. But actually, as a theorist, I really like. I would really like if I have a theory, I was taken so ex seriously by the experimental colleagues to to exclude it to its level if I'm <laughs> not finding it. So yeah, so that, that, that yeah, I, it's really something that's respectable. And uh, yeah, and now I'm going to like uh, find, uh, to discuss a, a potential theory, a new theory that can uh, like uh, save this scenario. So uh, like the reason we do it is because we really like this scenario without the some withdrawal mechanism. It's simple, it's quantum mechanics. And can we have some way, a simple way, to still like, uh, retain the nice feature of the, this mechanism, but uh, get away the experimental constraint? And uh, so this is a very simple idea I will uh, elaborate on. Uh, it's, uh, so basically, the idea is here. Uh, so the relic abundance of the dark matter is basically proportional to two things, as I explained. So why is the interaction rate for the neutrinos to be produced and destroyed, right? how often they, they, they do that? And then there's a mixing angle that controls the uh, conversion from active to strong neutrino per each cycle. Right? This is how many number of cycles and the probability for each cycle. That's the product is the relic abundance of the dark matter. And we know that for the minimum model where you just add the mixing, then the rate is basically governed by, by the weak interaction. And that's ruled out b because of the X-ray constraint. And then there's an intuition here. So can we add something to this uh, um, minimal enough to this structure. And uh, what I can do is that I can have some total rate of uh, neutrinos being produced and destroyed. And the higher rate, the rate is higher than the weak interaction, uh, so that I can make this term bigger, but I can, I'm allowed to make the theta smaller. And uh, just from the plot I, I showed uh, um, before, so making the theta smaller means moving the curve down, right? So if you move it into the white region, you, you are still OK with the current uh, uh, experimental constraint. So that's basically the, the intuition. And, uh, but there are, of course, it's not uh, like, uh, allowed to do anything. For example, we know that uh, neutrino interaction with, uh, for example, known particles like electrons, they are very tightly constrained already from like, uh, neutrino experiments. Uh, so I, I will not go to the details, but like, it's hard to come up with the interaction that's stronger than the weak interaction. Otherwise, we would find neutrino, like, we would find out evidence that the standard model is broken. 
and we didn't do that. Uh, so that's not a poss possible avenue to go. And what I'm going to talk about or advocate is that uh, actually we can consider the following possibility of neutrino talking to itself. Uh, so basically the idea is that in the standard model, neutrinos talk to itself through the exchange of the Z boson. So Z boson is one of the gauge bosons uh, that mediate weak interaction. Uh, but this interaction, this is, is predicted from the theory uh, of standard model, but uh, we really never directly measure it. So what does direct measurement mean would be that we build a neutrino neutrino collider, right? And then we, we look at the final state neutrinos and see how, how often they are they scatter. So that'd be a direct measurement. But we, we can't do that yet because neutrinos are so weakly interacting. We have proton-proton colliders or electron-positron colliders. So those are interacting much stronger. But we never build a neutrino, neutrino collider. So this interaction is actually only indirectly measured, and, uh, uh, which means that there is, there is a, a, like a room for new physics that um, accommodate a new mediator. I could call it a phi. And uh, so that can mediate a much stronger self-interaction among the neutrinos. And uh, it's still like, uh, allowed. And I'll show you how, how much it's allowed. And what happens to now is that I have this table, right? The standard model of particles plus the strong neutrino. I put it here because it's a fermion. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm adding another particle called the phi. And uh, so this is going to be a spin zero particle. So it's a, called a scalar particle. And uh, I'm going to make it a neutrino phyllic, so which means that it, among the standard model particles, it only chooses to couple to the neutrinos, okay, the active neutrinos. Uh, so, so that's the like a, a effective Lagrange I'm going to write here. Uh, and so this Lagrange like, is mass, but uh, like, uh, if you think of the Feynman diagram or the process, so basically the phi is mainly talking to neutrinos. And we can do that in, in the, uh, theoretically uh, as a new model. And uh, so I, I also want to point out, just as a subtlety, that when you like, uh, write down a Lagrangian, it had better respect uh, certain rules. And uh, for example, when you write the standard model, the symmetry is an important guideline. And this uh, interaction actually breaks many of the gauge symmetries of a standard model. But like, uh, this, you can think of this as a, view this as a low energy effective theory. So you have some like, uh, higher physics, higher scale physics that uh, respect all the symmetries of standard model, but uh, it gets broken and uh, at a low energy it looks like this. And uh, so the effect I'm going to talk about is all low energy, so I'm, I'm going to just use this uh, interaction. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to repeat uh, a little bit of what I just talked about, uh, the Donaldson withdrawal mechanism, but now I'm, I'm using a new interaction here. So before it was just a weak interaction, right? You have the weak interaction producing the neutrinos and then it oscillates into the, into the dark matter. And now uh, like we can consider different uh, scenarios because we have the mass of this new particle is free. And uh, the first case would be this is a heavy mediator, so which means the particle is heavy. And then I can repeat the calculation. I can choose the proper mass and the couplings of this particle. So m is the mass of phi, and the lambda is a phi neutrino coupling. And what I can do is I will make a high, bigger triangle, a uh, different position. And what happens here is that uh, at a high temperature, uh, like the neutrino self interaction is actually help to suppress the mixing angle, so you don't produce very much at a high temperature. And this is the same, similar for the weak interaction. And uh, because of this new interaction, the self interaction, it actually keeps the production of dark matter lasting longer. Right? Even though the weak interaction decouples in the early universe, it stops working, this self interaction may still be there and uh, operating. And therefore, you can still actually produce the active neutrinos and then let it oscillate into dark matter, and uh, it just shut down later. And uh, it can shut down later, at a later time. And therefore, you can, like, the bigger the triangle, the more the relic abundance. So you, you, get, uh, you can address the origin of dark matter this way. And uh, this, is, this is very like, uh, reminiscent of the original Donaldson withdrawal mechanism. But uh, there are other possibilities, especially when the mediator is light. Right? So what happens if the, the phi particle is light and it has some uh, reasonable coupling with neutrinos is that it's going to reach equilibrium with the neutrinos in the early universe. And then it is going to like, uh, exist in the plasma. And then what, there's a new way of creating the neutrinos, not just by scattering neutrino-neutrino uh, neutrino scattering, but through the decay of the phi into neutrinos. And so this is, you can consider this as a new way of 
like uh, producing the neutrinos, that, and the, maybe more parametrically, uh, the decay rate only goes through as the coupling square, but when you do scatter, it goes as higher of the coupling, so, which means that when the coupling is small, then the decay is actually more important than the uh, scattering process. And this actually, we find, is going to help us open new production channels. And uh, so another plot to show. So this is the same similar plot. And uh, so this is the original Donaldson withdrawal triangle. And now with the light mediator, you can really make up many new scenarios. For example, you can have the dark matter production following the blue curve or the red curve. So all kinds of interesting things can happen. I'm not going to the details, but I'm just going to show you this uh, like a kind of a money plot. Is that so? This is the original Donaldson withdrawal line, and there are constraints. And uh, so originally, you have to sit on this line, but when you turn on the new interactions, what we find is that we can live anywhere between the red hatched region. So which means that this uh, open wide white region is allowed. Uh, so you can successfully produce the dark matter relic abundance here. So although the mixing angle theta is so small here, much smaller than that, but you can, uh, you can make the relic abundance right with the new neutrino self interaction. Or maybe more precisely, let's just take a point on this plot, for example, here, okay, in the white space. And uh, so what is going to happen, what is driving the radical abundance right is, the, is there this curve. Uh, so for that point, you can sit anywhere on this orange curve uh, for the lambda versus um, coupling versus mediator mass. Then you can explain the dark matter radical abundance. You choose the dark matter mass and theta, and you can explain the radical abundance anywhere in this S-shaped curve. And so I, we have a collaborator whose letter of the last name is S, so we call it the S curve or the thin curve. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, right. So yeah, and, and uh, there are some details. I mean, you can like uh, if you assume these uh, interactions are shutting down, like uh, instantaneously in the early universe, you can do some like a uh, zeroth order estimate without solving Boltzmann equations, and then you can get uh, the parametrical dependence, and that explains why, for example, this curve is bending this way and, uh, and like, like the sh interesting shape, right? So this is, uh, like, uh, I want to point out, this is uh, like uh, a mechanism, what I discussed is a mechanism for dark matter production, and uh, the price of making the radical abundance right is this plot, right? So any dark matter mass and mixing, you, you need uh, a curve like this. And what this curve means is that it's actually exciting. It's a, a target for experimental probes. So what happens here is that I have a scalar particle I'm introduced, and uh, it has a certain coupling of it with the neutrinos, right? And uh, for example, you take a mass here, you have to have this coupling. And then the question is, can we look for this new particle experimentally and then probe the neutrino uh, self-interaction as an indirect probe of the dark matter origin, right? And uh, so I'm just showing this uh, uh, crowded plot. Uh, so this is uh, a... Actually, there are rich experimental probes when um, self interaction of neutrino is uh, introduced. So there are two ingredients in the story I just told. So there is the neutrino self interaction, and there is the strong neutrino dark matter, and uh, each of them involves a bunch of uh, like a uh, novel tests. Uh, so I, I think there are a lot of them. I will not go through everything, but I will highlight a few important directions that will impact uh, our upcoming experiment in, in the coming uh, few years. So the first one uh, is something we recently considered. It's called the mononeutrino uh, signal, right? So what this means, so we know like uh, this is uh, related to the beam neutrino experiment, uh, accelerator neutrino experiment. Uh, so basically, we can create a beam of neutrinos experimentally and look for it. And you can, this is a process that uh, could happen in a neutrino detector. So normally, we look for neutrinos through the charge current interaction. So we have neutrino coming in. Then through the weak interaction, which is this blue uh, thing here, it can turn into a muon, uh, which is a charged muon. And that's a, because it's charged, we can look for it experimentally. It's very, have a very characteristic signal. And that's, that's the charge current uh, detection of uh, active neutrinos. Uh, but here, with this new, new force carrier phi, what could happen is that right before the interaction, it can radi be radiated away from the neutrino beam. And the phi is going to decay back to neutrinos, so it uh, remains invisible. Uh, but this, it, its radiation leaves two signatures for the final state. Uh, 
Uh, so I'm going to highlight the second. So, but the first one is that the phi can carry away some uh, so-called lepton number or neutrino number. So which means instead of creating a mu with a minor sign, you create a, the wrong sign of the muon. So that's a potential signal for the experiments. Uh, but another more striking thing is that uh, the phi radiation can lead to the so-called missing transverse momentum signal for, uh, uh, for the final state, which means that you can measure the, if you can measure the full momentum of the final state particle, or three momentum of the final state particles, you sum, um, sum them up. I mean, without the phi radiation, it should point back to the beam direction where the neutrino is coming from. But now with this phi radiation, it can radiate in any direction. So it will cause some missing transverse momentum, right? Momentum is not conserved without phi, without knowing the phi is radiated. And we are thinking there are some places can, can look for it. So I'm a theorist, by the way. So I, I, I'm just making this proposal to the experimental colleague. So there is one, uh, one place we think is promising. It's called the Doon experiment. So it's happening in the US. So this uh, beam neutrino experiment. Uh, like, uh, you can see it's shooting from Fermilab to some period in South Dakota. Uh, so there's an underground mine, just like the Snow Lab. Uh, but yeah, and uh, so there's an intense neutrino beam shooting from here to here. And what, uh, is, uh, what we are focusing here is actually not uh, the big detector in South Dakota, but just uh, another smaller detector in the Fermilab uh, campus. Uh, so this is called the near detector. So it's uh, made of liquid argon. So it's, uh, the material of the detector is a liquid argon. And the people use that to look for the neutrinos because the argon has certain like, nice properties for finding the charged particles in the final state. And uh, so what I, we can imagine having, this is a, like a prototype of the Duan detector. So we have a neutrino beam coming in to produce a muon and a proton. I assume you can't dis, like, tell the charge. There's no magnetic field, so they go straight line. And uh, you find that the, mist, the, the momentum does not sum up to the beam direction, which you know where the source is coming from. And uh, so that's called a missing transverse momentum. It's called a mat in, uh, in uh, particle physics. So that's the signal we can look for. And just to make it uh, maybe more exciting to you, I'm, I'm stealing another uh, slide from other people. So this is uh, like a, a workshop happened uh, three years ago. It's called a pound. So it's a uh, physics opportunities of a near detector at Duen. And so basically, we are making this analogy is being made here is that, so this is uh, like a, a cartoon picture of the Large Hadron Collider, for example, the Atlas detector we are having here. And uh, with this detector, you can see it has many layers, the inner track, the calorimeter, and the muon chamber, and like, all kinds of things. And with this nice detector, we can make a lot of uh, like, uh, probes of new physics. So these are all the constraints we are getting using the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, the experimental colleagues we are having, because Duen is, not, is still being built, they're actually coming with, uh, up with all kinds of ideas, including the liquid argon detector. But there is also a gas search argon detector that could be magnetized. And they can also put an electron uh, calorimeter here. So it's actually also a packed up uh, detector, just like the large hydrogen collider. And hopefully, and this is a fake plot, uh, hopefully we can use this uh, like a setup to probe a bunch of new physics candidates. Uh, so one of them would be the MAT signal. And inspired by this uh, analogy, so what we have done is that we have like, done a theorist simulation about how the like, uh, missing energy uh, spectrum is. So this is basically a distribution of the final state event with the respect to the missing energy. And uh, so the signal uh, for different uh, scalar mass and coupling, we are getting the red or blue curve here. And uh, the background uh, we are estimating using some approximation is this blue curve. And you can see that uh, when you consider large missing transverse momentum, this is PT uh, slash. So for example, if we go to above a GeV scale, you are really not having so many background, but you are having a, like a still some reasonable amount of signal event at a doing experiment. So with this uh, like a missing energy as a handle, uh, we call it a mono neutrino. Uh, and that's a making analogy to the mono jet or mono X search uh, for, that's used at a large hydrogen collider, right? So you can use this as a handle to look for this type of new physics. And here is the rich curve I'm, I'm putting here. Uh, still, the lambda versus the phi are parameter space, but I'm putting some flavor index. I'm assuming this scalar couples to muon flavor neutrinos. So this is where we get a plenty of constraint. So the existing constraint, like the k on decay, and this, this is actually not labeled. This is from the z boson decay. So those are the existing constraints. And uh, this orange curve is the relic abundance target we just talked about. And uh, 
the doing, uh, we were estimating it could have a ridge that uh, covers anything above this blue curve. Uh, so that's kind of exciting, right? Because especially given this model that we can have a target here, so this region of parameter space will be probed or could potentially be probed by the doing if we do if they do uh, like the what they promised. Uh, so this is this is uh, like a one uh, possibility, and there's a cosmological constraint from BBN uh, that sets a lower bound on the fine mass. I will talk about that uh, uh, in a minute. So another place to look for this missing uh, momentum signal is uh, actually called the forward physics facility at a Large Hadron Collider, and this is a map uh, between France and Switzerland, and this is where the Large Hadron Collider, the the ring, the circular collider happens, right? I'm going to zoom in to where this atlas detector is happening. And here's a better re reading cartoon plot. So the atlas collider detector is somewhere here. And this is our RHC beam, right? The, it's a circular collider, so the beam will bend away when you go further. But people are proposing to put some forward detectors in, uh, in the uh, PP collision direction. And this is forward detectors also sees a reasonable amount of neutrinos because of the forward production of particles. And we can imagine considering uh, some uh, the similar mononeutrino process here. And there are some differences between this and the doing is that here we are talking about a large hadron collider. So the energy of neutrinos you produce is much higher. It's in the hundreds of GeV scale. And which is this high energy neutrinos, you can have a lot less theoretical uncertainties. For example, for the neutrinos scattering on the target, we can just use the parton picture. Uh, which is uh, like uh, better understood. And without going to the details, I'm just showing that uh, in a recent work I, I'm doing with a postdoc at Carlton and some uh, external collaborators, we find that uh, the forward physics facility with some reasonable uh, detector performance can cover the region above this purple uh, curve uh, up here. So basically all the high mass region of the, this uh, production mechanism could, could be covered. So that's, that's kind of exciting and hopefully encouraging for the experimental people. So that's, uh, that's about the neutrino uh, self-interaction. And uh, I think I'm running uh, uh, low in time, but uh, I will just uh, maybe be a bit faster. So, so now the next thing I'm going to talk about is actually a pro probe of the, both the neutrino self-interaction and the dark matter. Because after all, this is a mechanism for the dark matter relic abundance. And you can look at this diagram I just showed. This is a diagram for producing the dark matter in the early universe. But actually, it also caused the dark matter to decay. So if you think of this new four is the initial state, and then it can decay into three neutrinos. Okay? And uh, with some uh, like, uh, trace of parameters, and actually, I want to point out that this trace of parameters corresponds to somewhere here on this blue, uh, this orange curve, so on the target. Uh, actually, I find that dark matter mass, uh, lifetime is actually not much longer than the age of the universe, perhaps one or two other magnitude higher than that. Okay? And uh, so the dark matter has a mass of keV, so it's decaying to some like, uh, new contribution of cosmic neutrinos in the energy of a uh, keV scale. And this is uh, the neutrino spectrum we are expecting in the standard model or in the, uh, in the context of standard model without fit new physics. So we are seeing neutrinos, or we are expecting neutrinos at different energies, and this vertical axis is their flux. So there's the Big Bang remnant neutrinos that's here uh, at a lower energy. And then there are solar neutrinos that are found in the Nobel Prize. And there's the atmospheric neutrinos. And there's also some actual uh, galactic ones from, measured by the S ice cube. So this, this is basically the spectrum. And because the dark matter I'm talking about has a mass around keV that's somewhere here. So what I will do is I'm zoom in to a smaller window uh, in this blue box. And I'm plotting the resulting neutrino flux from the dark matter decay in our Milky Way galaxy compared to the background. The background is called the solar background. It's mostly solar neutrinos coming from the sun. And that's this blue, black dashed region. And uh, for different dark matter mass, so I just set their lifetime to 10 times of the age universe. You can see that you can get a much bigger, uh, much bigger flux compared to the background. So, so one, uh, like a, this is a one challenge to our experimental colleagues that the KEV neutrino from the sun, for example, has never been, like a, pro, been detected experimentally. And now I'm pre providing you with something even better. So you can see this flux for uh, like a, like a 
5 keV dark matter is like several orders of magnitude higher than what the sun can produce. And then the challenge is, can you really detect it experimentally? And uh, we have like some thoughts, just uh, briefly, uh, like more work needs to be done. So we were considering that uh, one way is to look for neutrino electron scattering. And this could happen in the low noise dark matter detectors. But uh, given the rate, it has to be the really big ones, like uh, Darwin or Argo. So this is like a, a potential target for future uh, detectors. And uh, yeah, we'll do more work on this. I, I don't have a, a paper for that yet. And finally, uh, I think in the last few minutes, I just comment on the, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, as I just showed earlier, it sets a lower limit on the scalar mass. And the reason is that if the scalar is light, uh, it's uh, in the universe, then it contributes to some of the energy and contributes to the expansion rate of the universe. And there are handles, observables, like the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. You can do a cosmological calculation, just like the, the early paper, like uh, the idea, that you can do it more precisely these days. And by fitting, like for example, you can fit the helium abundance in the early universe, and you can fit the deuterium abundance, then you have to live in this red region. And uh, so that uh, is sensitive to two parameters. One is how many baryon symmetry you have in the universe. And then the other is how many ne effective neutrinos you have in the universe. So in the standard model, the prediction is three. But with a lighter scalar, the, the prediction will be higher than three. And then you can therefore get a constraint. Uh, but there is a subtlety with this constraint is that it assumes the scalar is there in the universe. So it's thermalized. And uh, so what would you could imagine is that uh, you can consider a very light and a very weakly coupled scatter that does not couple to that not thermalize with neutrinos uh, during the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. It only thermalizes afterwards. So we can have this three-stage thing that at uh, uh, before the BBN, uh, right before the BBN, neutrino is there in the universe, but there is no phi or very little phi. And then like uh, that BBN happens and complete. And then neutrino and the phi come into equilibrium. You can do that theoretically. And then uh, afterwards, like uh, when the phi becomes heavy, you decay back to neutrinos. So it's something that uh, temporarily exists in the universe, like a ghost. It doesn't exist uh, back uh, then and doesn't exist today. But it's playing some role in driving the change of the energy and the entropy uh, budget of the universe. Actually, it's, it's actually both of them are going got to increase. Uh, so yeah, for example, the thermalization process you are summarizing something, it's not reversible, right? So you have to increase the entropy. So in the second stage, you have to increase the energy. So in the end, all the energy and the entropy will increase, and the increase of energy will cause the increase of N effective. So these two things are closely tied to each other. And therefore, we are having, this is a noisy plot. So we are having this uh, like interplay that for like a certain phi, low mass phi, so this is a KeV range, uh, and uh, for the coupling, if you go in this direction pointed by the arrow, so the more you go, so the more ineffective you are like, uh, predicting from the theory. So there is a minimum value, which is 0.12, but you can, it can get higher. And on the other hand, I can use this mechanism to produce dark matter, right? Because in this st three stage story, so the phi, when it eventually decays, it can decay into neutrinos, but it can still have a small uh, decay branching ratio to the dark matter. And that, that we found it can be enough. And uh, so for different choice of dark matter mass, you just need to live on this uh, black curve. And uh, so this, this is like the, this is the interplay. And also it depends on the parameter theta, right? And here we are choosing the maximum allowed theta by the x-rays. So which means that uh, you cannot go further lower because for smaller theta, you would need a bigger coupling to compensate. So this is at the lowest possible you can go, and the curve eventually bends up because the, the phi has to be heavier than the dark matter, right? So it bends up. And from the shape, you can see that you, you, have, you, can, you can't go arbitrarily like, to the lower left, so which means you get a lower limit on the Dirtan effective uh, for, for this kind of scenario. And uh, I'm showing this uh, last couple of plot. So there's a, a nice interplay between the dark matter indirect detection, which is sets constraint on theta, and the prediction in the delta effective um, if phi is light, light. And this is the current uh, uh, situation. So we are having the upper limit on theta, and therefore we are predicting the lowest uh, delta effective, and uh, especially the effective for the cosmic microwave background. So there is a new class of experiment that's probing that. And you can see that for 
the, the lowest possible value you can get here is for low dark matter mass around the KeV scale, and then the lowest value is 0 0.12. Uh, so this is the current limit, and uh, given the uh, precision of the upcoming cosmic uh, CMB stage four experiment, so these are telescopes built in the southern hemisphere in, in the South Pole and uh, and the Chile, I think Chile. Uh, so they they like they they can make the precision measurement of Dirtin effect to a few percent level. So, which means that the point 12 is not a small number at all. And this is the current limit. And uh, a future interesting interplay would be if you think of the future probes, for example, the Athena, which looks for the X-rays from the dark matter decay, and it could set a stronger upper limit on the theta. And uh, the price of that, you would need uh, like stronger neutrino self-interaction, and that uh, predict the higher values of Dirt and Effective. For example, here, we are, if, if Athena finds nothing, we will get a Dirt and Effective bigger than 0.3. And that is for sure going to be like, uh, detected by the CMB S4 experiment. And uh, another nice uh, interplay is time scale, that both of the Athena and the CMB S4 are planned to be like, operating toward the end of this century. So which means that they, are, they can really happen together to to test uh, this theory. Uh, so I think, I think I'm going to end here. It's, uh, it's about time. And uh, yeah, I think I'm, I, I, I talk about uh, different uh, things. Uh, just to wrap up, um, I, in this talk, I have like, uh, tried to go, to, to go through the direction where I assume there is a close connection between dark matter and neutrino physics. And uh, there are many possibilities, but I'm just taking one particular example, which is the strong neutrino dark matter. There's a puzzle. Uh, related to its origin, and I'm introducing neutrino self-interaction to address the origin. And it really leads to a number of experimental probes, like you can use the accelerating accelerator neutrino experiment, you can use the Large Hadron Collider, and you can use the, um, the dark matter direct detector for the indirect detection, and you can look for the sky to look for trace in the cosmic microwave background. So I think this is really uh, like uh, some theory that connect the different uh, frontiers of particle physics and cosmology together. And uh, so let's hope uh, some discoveries um, may be made in this direction. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here. And this is a picture I, I used last year for a virtual talk. It seems still useful, like uh, appropriate <laughs> here. But, uh, but I hope I, I can stop using it uh, very soon. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for a great talk, and uh, it was interesting talk, and uh, there was a lot of challenge to the experimenter uh, physicists, and I would like to say we like to exclude theoretical lines ourselves, so it's good to have a lot of theoretical lines out there. Okay, do we have uh, any question? Any person question? Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the uh, the dark matter decay to three neutrinos. Yeah. What's the, how high can you go in mass in your model ah. sort of to be able to be, s to see this in, in current neutrino detectors? Okay, very good. So let me, let me first show this plot. Uh, so here's like the highest you can go. It's about a, a MeV scale in the dark matter mass. Yeah. So, so, and. Uh, so you're, you're stuck below an MeV. You have to be below MeV. Yeah, so it's really a KeV to MeV scale neutrino uh, detection. And I'm just uh, showing you here that for, for different dark matter mass, you get a different height of the curve. And just because the heavier dark matter has a less of a population, right, the radical abundance is conserved. And therefore, you get a lower curves for heavier ones. And, uh, but, but I think the trade-off trade is that the heavier dark matter decays to more energetic neutrinos. And we know more energetic neutrinos are easier to, to have a weak interaction, right? So yeah, so this is just about the flux, and uh, just in, you have to trans do some work to translate it into the event rate. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering if something like Borixino or Camland mm -hmm. or SuperK would have already seen something. Right. Yeah, but I think I think like that would be like a going to the like Borixino, for example. The the threshold is about 200 keV, so that that's that's probably not useful here for these masses. Yeah, but yeah, so that that's you you need. I think maybe dark matter detector is better because of the lower threshold. But yeah, but I welcome any ideas or suggestions. I'd be, I'm, I really want this to be detected. <laughs> uh, any other question? All right. Hey, uh, 
I just wanted to ask if you could say a little bit more actually about the um, vertex that connects two neutrinos to your phi particle. I, I have two questions really. One is, are there any electroweak precision constraints on that, you know, based on two leptons go to two Ws or something with neutrinos running in the loop and then like a vacuum expectation value of phi? So that would go away if the vacuum mm -hmm. expectation value of phi is zero, but I'm not sure if, if that's in your theory or not. Yeah. The second right. question, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. No, go ahead, yeah. Oh, and, and the second question is, uh, is it possible to link this up uh, to uh, a leptogenesis scenario, I guess in the case that phi is complex or something like that? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, very good. So maybe the first question, so so I'm showing here the, the this plot. So there are, there are two curves here, the, the green and the purple. So I, th I think this belongs to the category of a standard model precision test. Uh, for example, the K on decay, how it works is charge K on decay. It have a leptonic decay into a neutrino and uh, a, a, like a muon. And uh, so here the neutrino can radiate alpha phi, so it becomes a three-body decay, uh, neutrino phi and a muon. And what happens is that it will distort the energy spectrum of the final state muon. So that, that will be uh, like a signal you can, you can look for, and that sets this constraint. Uh, and similarly, the, the Z decay constraint, is, this is more like an electroweak precision, right? You look for the invisible width of the Z boson, and uh, because of the phi radiation, it's an actual uh, invisible width, and uh, therefore you can set uh, that constraint. So, so these this are, this are tree-level process, though. So, yeah, it's not, not yet loop-level, yeah. So, yeah, I think, I think loop-level would occur if you have some flavor off-diagonal uh, couplings, then you can maybe look for some like, flavor changing effect. That, that, that can be useful, too. Okay, and, and for, for the second question is the, um, is about, sorry, what was that? Uh, oh, just, just can, a, you, can you embed this into a leptogenesis? Uh, yeah, very good, yeah, that's right. Leptogen. So I, I didn't think of that uh, yet, yeah. So I, I, I don't have a, like a, a good idea or working idea, yeah. But, but I think that that's, a, that's a, a, like an interesting direction to, to work. Yeah, it may, may, may impact, it's like, there are ideas of neutrino oscillation to, to leptogenesis, I, th I think that's probably some, something related. Yeah, I'm happy to discuss more. Okay, yeah, great, thanks. Thank you, any other questions, comments? Okay, if, uh, if not, I don't think there was any online questions, so, okay. Then let's thank speaker again, and <laughs> so the speaker we spend the time um, for about an hour in the lounge with the graduate students. So if you're interested in talking to speaker, please remain and and go along with your conversation. Thank you very much for coming in person. All right, thanks.